this right here is what keeps me coming back. All right, welcome back to another Serious Anger podcast, episode number 149. We're joined tonight with uh, Mr. Derek Hudnall, the Bassmaster Elite Series. And uh, Andy, what's going on, my man? Not much. Um, I think I'm going to jump into Derb on Sunday. So I'm pretty excited about that one. thought my Is it so- might have been over, but I was like, ah, we'll get one more that's going to be 60 degrees out on Sunday, so why not? Oh, man. Yeah, it's 60 degrees here. It's going to be 70? 70? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have another Louisiana folk here uh, to my, my left, Mr. Zach Hall. I've been watching the Bass Nation Snapchat. Uh, Zach has been running that this week. He'll be joining us tonight as well. And, uh, yeah, we've had, what, 60? It's supposed to be 70 on Saturday for tournament day. Yeah. It's, it's supposed getting to be warmer warm. each day Drink we've been Gator- here for the past four days. Drink your Gatorade yeah. oh. and eat your Wheaties. Yeah, every morning starts out with bibs, jacket, winter hat, freezing our butts off to three hours later, we're sweating. So, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a roller coaster, but it's it's fun. We're, we're figuring things out down here on Chick. And He's figuring things out. <laughs> I heard. More, good, more gooder than me. <laughs> gooder. <laughs> I was there. He pulled up on me and said, hey, I just caught two. I was like, oh, I just fished that. <laughs> we call that the Bailey cool. experience. Yeah. So what? He's doing good. He's doing good. The Bailey experience. Oh, he does that quite often. Oh Oh, yeah. Simon, would you like to say hello to the folks? Hello, folks. (laughs) Yeah, this is Simon saying with us as well. Oh, you doing? Hello, Kai. Simon, good to see you again, bud. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, dude, it's 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 fun down here on Chick, and excited to get to Saturday. But I'm also excited to talk to our guest here. Might as well bring him on, Mr. Derek Hudnall. What's going on, sir? What's up, guys? How are you? Good evening. Doing well, man. Doing well. How about y'all? Y'all are up there on Chick, and you said it's it's fun on Chick right now. It was not so much fun when yeah. we were there. No, it's it's entirely different. I mean, when I first yeah. put in on Tuesday, I saw forty eight degree water temps. So that was uh, it was. Kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah, I thought I was still still in New York. I had warmer temps in New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We didn't have forty eight. I wish we'd have had forty eight degrees there. But uh, man, Chick was a tough one when we were there. Um, for sure, co-host Miss Miss Peyton right here, star, star <laughs> yeah. of the show. She, she is the brains of the operation and the star of the show. Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, dude, first and foremost, how is uh, how's Louisiana doing? Are they recovering? How are how are things? We're recovering. I mean, Louisiana is resilient in so many ways. Um, you know, I can I, I've lost count. I don't have enough fingers for the storms that's hit us this year. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm in Baton Rouge. You know, I'm 150 miles or so the way the crow flies inlet. You know, from the from the Gulf. So, you know, the, the, actually, the couple of bad storms that we had for here in Baton Rouge, I was on the road. You know, Chickamauga one hit, and I think we were Gunnersville and another one hit. Um, so, but you know, the folks at the coast, especially the west side of the state, Lake Charles area, uh, man, really got hit hard, and even the southeast side. Um, down in like St. Bernard, St. Pla- you know, Plaquemines Parish. Uh, man, those guys just, you know, they just can't recover from one until another one hits. And in COVID on top of that, you know, Louisiana has been one of the hotbeds in the nation um, for COVID. And it's just, dude, we got 2020 this year. I mean, what can I say? You know, I mean, that's just right. it is what it is. You know, it's just this year's, just been, you know, nothing surprises you. Um Man, we're ready to get into 2021, man. That, oh, that, that's, that's just, that's, let's move forward. Let's get ahead of this and let's just turn the page and move forward. And, you know, uh, but, you know, we're doing okay. You know, like I said, the, the folks here in Louisiana are they're very resilient and, um, you know, we'll bounce back from anything. We've been through Katrina's and oil spills and everything else. And, uh, you know, yep. a little wind's not going to keep us down. Heck yeah. Where are you from in Louisiana? I grew up 30 minutes north of Lake Charles. Lake Charles. I spent like the first 25 years of my life there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 They've taken a beating up there in, in that area. For sure. Yeah. We sure have. Yeah. Well, before we get too deep in the podcast here, Derek, you know, talk to us a little bit because you're new to the show. 
Uh, yeah. We want to know your, your first bat catch, what that story was like, who got you into fishing whole nine yards. I mean, dude, I, I grew up into fishing. Um, you know, most everybody in Louisiana knows my dad, Roger Hudnall. Um, he's, you know, probably one of the most decorated anglers in the state, you know, in, in the past. And, you know, so I grew up, you know, when I was knee high to a grasshopper, I was fishing and I was, you know, watching my dad fish these tournaments. And, you know, my dad had um, multiple opportunities to fish, you know, at the time, the, the, the BASS top 150s and, um, and he couldn't, he had to turn it down. He, I think he had three or four different invites throughout his career and he just had to turn it down. You know, I, I my family didn't have money when I was growing up. Um, and you know, he was the breadwinner in the family and he didn't know sponsorships or anything like that. So when he got those calls, you know, he had to turn them down. And, uh, and I can vividly remember watching him do that. And, and I told myself, if I ever got that opportunity, there's no way I could turn it down. Um, Right. Well, it's been a dream of mine. You know, my most vivid memory was, um, let's see, it was, uh, ni 1989 when Hank Parker held up. I was nine years old, sitting on the couch, and I remember it with my dad watching the 1989 Bassmaster Classic, and Hank Parker held that classic trophy up over his head on the James River in Virginia. And, um, you know, I don't know if there's been a day that's went by that I hadn't thought about that moment mm -hmm. and said, I want that to be me. You know, I want to be on that stage. And, uh, you know, here I am, I'm 40 years old now. You know, I, I wish I had this opportunity was when I was in my young 20s to take this leap, um, you know, that some of the other guys have gotten. But um, but I'm here. You know, I got to fish the Classic last year in 2019, qualified through the Opens, you know, and got to see a lot of the guys that went to MLF, you know, got to fish with the, with the Van Dams and Ike and Ellie's in last year's Classic in, in, in Knoxville, the Tennessee River. And, mm -hmm. Man, that was surreal, but I can promise you when they sung the national anthem, when we had 8,000 people watching us at takeoffs in those morning, um, I just wanted to eat somebody's face off because I'm going to tell you, it burns me inside. I want to win that thing so bad. And, um, and uh, you know, it's just, it's just something that just, it just burns you in your soul deep, and you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I just, you know. It, it, and so I grew up in it, man. I grew up in it and it, it's always been a part of my life and it's always been something that, I, that I've always motivated myself and just dream big. You know, if you guys, anybody follows me on any of my social media avenues, I hashtag dream big on absolutely every post. And that's because that's what I've done from day one. You know, if a guy like me from nothing and no money come from where I came from and I got here, anybody watching the show right now can. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, Making a qualifying for the Elite Series in 2019, fishing the Classic, you know, that was just step three of 10, you know, in my goals. Um, but it, that man, that was a, it was a, uh, man, what a journey it's been, but my journey's not even halfway through yet. So I grew up into it. I've dreamed it all my life. I've, I've made some great relationships and partnerships all, along the way. Um, and uh yeah man it's just always been in my blood and and that's this is there's nothing else in this world i'd rather do than what i'm doing right now and uh love it man love it absolutely love it i think my biggest takeaway from this show today is i want to fish so bad that i want to eat somebody's face off <laughs> I, that, dude, i'm telling you man <laughs> and it's like you're staying with your friends you know i room with you know, I've traveled with John Cruz and Zaldane and Ed Locke, and we all travel together throughout the year. And, you know, we all help each other out. And it's right. like, man, when that national anthem is sung and, and they call your boat number, it's like, let's go. I'd run, I'd run over you if you got in front of me. I mean, that's just, you know, <laughs> especially yeah. in that classic last year, I was like, I could never remember, you know, I can, I can remember because I was making a long run on the Tennessee River uh, in, the, in the Bassmaster Classic in Knoxville last year. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I actually, I actually passed Van Dam. You know, got a couple of corners, and I cornered him one time and passed him. And I'm just, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I shot him you know, at one point. <laughs> but it, I didn't care. I just, you know, you know it, it, it's, it, it's been a blast, man. And I'm just, I'm, I'm ready for 2021 now. And uh, you know, man, life's good, brother. Life's good. Heck yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously you mentioned your dad was big into bass fishing and tournament fishing. And so obviously, uh, you know, that was your route into tournaments, but talk to us, you know, about your timeline from when you realized that you wanted to do it for a living until, you know, where you're at now on the elite series. Well, 
I always knew I, this is what I wanted to do for a living. That, there was never any doubt with that. It was just finding a path to it. You know, and it, it's very expensive to do, to fish the Bassmaster League Series. Very expensive, guys. And the one thing that you have to be on the front end is you better be a good businessman. You better be a very good businessman or you better win all the time. One of the two. If you don't do one of the two or both very good, you're just not going to make it. So in 2015, I took the leap um, and I finished all three divisions of the Bassmaster Opens full time. I completely wrapped my boat and my truck, even though I lost money that year. Mm. But I needed to show value before. You know, that was the I needed to concentrate on the business side of it before because I needed to grow my brand and my value from the start. So when I did qualify, I could have the brand awareness and the value to be able to take that leap. You know, it's not, and people think, you know, man, when you qualify for the elite series, sponsors just come out of nowhere. And that is absolutely false. That does not happen. When I qualified for the elite series, I had no one knocking at my door to come pay me a bunch of money to fish the next year. Just right. not how it works. You have to have the value just because you're fishing the elite series does not mean you're worth all this money. But they said that that's just not the, um, that's just not the way it works. Um, so, um, I started that way and, and, and I actually, you know, part of my social media following for a couple of years, and I'm actually about to start it up again. I, I did a, I did a Facebook and YouTube live series called build your brand where I was trying to help a lot of young anglers, you know, understand the importance of building your personal brand coming up because you need to show value in order to get what you're trying to get in advance. So, you know, for three years, I fished the Bassmaster Opens. I really concentrated on the business end of it. Um, and I fished all three divisions. Not necessarily, yes, it was giving me a better chance to qualify for the Elite Series because the Elite Series only takes five. You know, you know five, you know, the, the top five in a division. But I didn't, I wanted the experience, you know, upstate New York, St. Clair, Champlain, St. Lawrence River. Uh, Coosa River, you know, Norman, you know, there's just there, there's Table Rock. It's just it's different everywhere you go. And the, the last thing I wanted to do was qualify for the Elite Series, go up north and get my butt kicked because I don't even know what a smallmouth looks like. <laughs> um, so that's what I did. And, 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 it, and, it, and it's worked out. You know, the three years I fished the Opens, I, I just I have such a crush on smallmouth. I just I have so much fun catching them. Um, and it's, you know, and, and I've actually done pretty well on the Northern swing both years in the elite series, you know, with those small mouth, I'm by no means a small mouth expert, but I just have so much fun catching them. And, and my two or three biggest bags that I've weighed in, in the elite series have all been small mouth, you know, St. Clair, uh, St. Clair weighed in a 25 pound bag last year in the AOI championship. Uh, I've weighed in two, like 23 plus pound bags on St. Lawrence river this year. Um, and, and the, the past couple of years, but I just have so much fun catching them up there. But the right. experience and the knowledge that you gain by going up there and fishing that, you know, is really going to pay dividends in the long run. So, yeah. so I grew up, I grew up in fishing. Um, I took the leap in 2015. My third year, I qualified, uh, finished third that year, qualified for the classic in the elite series. Um, and all three years, there was at least one division in the, in the opens where I was close to qualifying and at least one division. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad it didn't happen until the, after the third year, just simply because it gave me the experience on a lot of bodies. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm from South Louisiana. When I started fishing the opens, I, mean, I never fished in more than three foot of water, you know? So, and I mean, I, I have no problem fishing deep. I have no problem fishing a drop shot or or a dang spy bait on eight pounds floor carbon. That's just, I have so much fun doing that now. Um, and it's just, you just, you're never too old to learn. You're all, I'm always a student of the game. And I never, I never leave an event without picking up or learning something. Mm -hmm. and that's so key to evolving as an angler, just in general, you don't have to be the top level pro, but just never leave an event without saying, you know, this is what I learned. This is what I took away from it because that's going to make you a better angler in the future. And, uh, you know, it, it's fish as much as you can fish, get outside of your comfort zone. And that's what I did for three years. Get outside of your comfort zone and, uh, you know, and grow.
And, and that's what I try to do every single year. And I'm still doing it today. Right. You, you had mentioned how some of your biggest bags are small mouth on the elite yeah. series. And we talked offline quickly about your eight pounder that you caught on Cayuga. Cayuga. <laughs> is that, is that the biggest fish you've you've caught on the Elite Series, or have you caught bigger? Um, no, I, man, I had caught I caught an eight something at St. John's River last year, first turn of the first turn of the season. I caught another eight something at Lake Fork last year. Nice. Um, I've caught some heavy sevens. Um, I don't it was think the it, biggest fish north of like Louisiana. Yeah, and, and I'm trying. I, I don't I don't know verbatim. You know, I don't know verbatim exact. That it could have been, but you know, St. John's River last year, I had an eight. I want to say it was an eight two or an eight three, but I mean, they were weighing in like nines and tens. So my eight two was like a guppy. So it didn't. <laughs> it, it could have been, but I did. I bet I've caught some some eights um, in practice. I mean, in the tournaments in the last couple of years, but it was pretty close. I mean, but yeah, Cayuga. You know, that that, that place has just got them. You know, yeah. just uh, you know. Upstate New York, you know, around the Buffalo area, and it, it was just—it's incredible. But dominated by largemouth. That was a tournament that I went into. I had actually found a really good pattern on smallmouth. Mm. I actually really thought I was going to catch some smallmouth fishing. Um, They're still going to catch a smallmouth, and I ended up the first day I caught that eight. I caught like another four and a three and a half that morning. I weighed in three fish that weighed sixteen and a half pounds the first day. <laughs> Three, my smallmouth didn't bite. It clouded up a lot of wind. I needed the I needed the sun up high and slick calm. And the second day, I weighed in almost twenty pounds, and they were all smallmouth. Um, I had to really have the smallmouth peg when that sun would come up high. Mm -hmm. I know. And I, I got up on stage day two, weighed in twenty pounds of smallmouth. And Dave Mercer was like, "Man, what the heck's wrong with you? You're South Louisiana, I mean, weighing three largemouth the first day, and then twenty pounds of smallmouth the second day." And it's just, <laughs> like, dude, I just, I mean, don't hate, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, yeah, Cayugas are, and we were supposed to go there again this year, but uh, the whole COVID situation, they had to change yeah. again. We actually got put back on Gunnersville. Um, I hope we go back there next year. You know, pretty yeah. sure we'll be back at St. Lawrence River, Waddington. I hope so. But, uh, you know, Cayugas are really good northern swing, kind of, um, in just a few, in just a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Of course, wants to mention. Uh, yeah, man, Caillou. Yeah, yeah, it's it's always good when you win big bass in a tournament. And I've, you know, I've had a couple. I think the the swing we made at Gunnersville, we went Gunnersville, Santee Cooper, and um, Chickamauga back to back. And all three of those tournaments, I had second place big bass in all three of them. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. Swing. Not nice because I got because <laughs> it's not first. <laughs> nothing for it. So yeah, you know, it was it's just, a pattern you're know, consistent. Bad. <laughs> yeah, just in, you know, and I th you think you're gonna get it, and all of them was like day three, and then somebody weighs in a giant, you know. But yeah. uh, and I love fishing. I just love fishing for big ones in places that, that the big ones just live, and right. you know, just yeah. you know, just gets me up every morning. Love right. catching big ones. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. And then Lake Fork that we just came through from now. Yeah, I didn't catch any of those giants there, uh, but did okay. Yeah. Top twenty at Lake Fork to end the season. Texas Fest, that's always a good one that you want to do good one, do good in, you know, as an elite series guy, because number one, if you win it, you're automatically in the classic. Mm -hmm. And two, our, it's a million dollar payout for us. So our payouts are, are, are um, you know, from top to bottom are, are inflated. Um, so that's always one you want to do good in. And I've typically done, I've, I've got, I've, I've had pretty good history at Lake Fork. I, I get it and understand it and love that place. Um, but man, heck of a 2020 season, you know, no complaints other than, you know, it just – you have to be consistent. And, and I, I did not do well in the first three tournaments of the year. And uh, the last six, you know, I made five of the six cuts, you know, a couple of top tens and made a really good run there at the end, had a good second half of the season. But you just you just have to be consistent here. You have to be consistent because, you know, my goals are, along with everybody else's, I want to compete for an AOI championship and I want to fish the Bassmaster Classic. And if you don't accomplish all of those, we're just not happy. And I'm not, and I'm not you know, I've just barely missed it again. Um, but yeah, I just pulled up 48. So you're six out of the cut. Man, tough season. You know, it, it's, you know, and last year, I think, I, I think I want to say I finished exactly the same last year. Now, last year I took a zero in that one tournament that I got disqualified in, but still almost made the classic. Well, right? 
that was Hartwell. Um, and, you know, and I still almost made it. I had a, actually had a really good year last year. Um, I just made a bonehead mistake. And, and, and that cost me fishing the classic at Gunnersville this year. Um, this year, and then 2020, I just, I just was not consistent enough, you know, just, it just, you know, and, and that's, and that's all on me, you know, just wasn't consistent enough. Um, but you know, yes, it burns, it pains me. It just, but you just got to make yourself better. You got to keep pushing and you got to say, Hey, 2021, I'm going to approach it differently. I'm going to, I'm not going to say I'm going to fish differently because I'm going to stay true to who I am. I'm not one of those guys that say, hey, I'm going to stay shallow or, hey, I'm going to stay deep and I'm going to stay this. I like to consider myself a versatile angler. You know, I can catch them deep. I can catch them shallow. I can catch them, you know, finesse, you know, so I just I just go with the flow and I just want to better myself as an angler at, you know, at doing anything so I can adapt to changes and really, you know, in the future be the angler that I think I'm capable of being. So yeah. let's take a step back here when you're, Prepping for a tournament, yeah. do you ever go in thinking I'm going to catch them one way and then by the end of day one practice, you're like, all right, I got to do something else? Almost 100% of the time, yeah. Like, oh, always. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, that's that's just – you go into an event and I'm going to catch them this way, exactly. And, yeah, and that almost never works. <laughs> almost never works unless you're in somewhere like a – St. Lawrence River. I mean, yeah. everybody's drifting current. I mean, we got to fish at Lake Ontario this year, and that's where it was won at. But St. Lawrence River. I mean, it, it, if you don't, if we don't get to fish Lake Ontario, everybody's drifting current. I mean, that's just that's just what everybody does. You know, a St. Clair. You know, you can kind of. I'm going to catch them one of three or four ways at St. Clair. You know, because St. Clair is a bold grass. You're going to catch them cranking. You're going to catch them on spy bait. You're going to catch them drop shot. I mean, you just, that's just the way that tournament's going to be won every single year. Um, but other, you know, outside of those tournaments, you just don't know. But it was so different because we had, you know, um, Gunnersville and uh, um, Chickamauga and Santee Cooper and Lake Fork all in the fall, guys. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. and, those, and those places fished completely different than they should have when we were supposed to fish them early in the year. Because fall, let's face it, guys, the fall stinks. It sucks. It's because those fish don't know that they're, they're, they're not staying in one place at one time. They don't group up. They roam. They scatter. And just as soon as you figure out a pattern, you better go do something else. Chickamauga this year, first day, I weighed in two fish for three pounds, guys. I was like in 76th place. Day two, I weighed in. 18 something, the second biggest bag of the tournament, and I jumped up like 60 spots. I was in the top 20 after day two. <laughs> and day three, I zero, zero, nothing. What do you do? You know, it's just, it, you can't depend on anything in the fall. You have to fish free every single day and just hope something works. And it's, you know, I, I, and I don't want to say it's luck because everybody in the Elite Series and everybody, a lot of, guys that fish these big tournaments can fish, but it's like, man, you know, to get something in the fall like that going and it's just so incredibly difficult. Um, Santee, right. you know, Santee Cooper, I, I got, was fortunate enough to, to get out of there with the top 10 this year. Um, and it was just painful. Um, I was, you know, throwing a flick in a little weight, a little weightless missile base, 48 wacky style, wacky worm on cypress trees. And, you know, sitting there watching it fall for 15 seconds to get to the bottom and two and a half foot of water. Um, it's just, that's the fall. Oh man, it's painful. It's painful. And that's when they would hit it right before it hit the bottom too. About when you're just, you know, your, your arms are really back in. And then it's like, Oh, there he is. You know, seven pounder, um, yeah. you know, and then you'll go three more hours without the bite. Um, but you just don't know, you know, that's just the thing about the fall and, and the way the plate, you know, the, I did a bourbon and bass episode last week is about, you know, how, you know, this is, this is the year of the Garmin. I mean, Top five in AOI, you know, all Garmin, except for Jake Whitaker. He was a Lawrence. He was in fifth. Um, but guys are all Garmin. And, and you know, and it's, you know, I, I don't – it would have shaped up differently if the season would have been played out like it was supposed to. If we could have fished you fallen, dude, you follow would have been in the spawn. Like, first week in April, that would have been a slugfest if that would have worked out. Santee Cooper would have been 
second half of the spawn to post spawn, but those fish would have been on beds and you would have seen massive weights come in there. Sabine River, you know, they got they got moved because of COVID um, in South Louisiana. I mean, that's an app. I mean, guys, that's two hours from the house. That's an absolute crap hole. But um, that, that would have really, that would have really, you know, thrown a monkey wrench in the thing, you know, because they scheduled it from there to Caillou and then back down to, to Gunnersville. Um, and, you know, it's just, just, you know, 2020 is just, it's, it's been wild. I mean, what do you do? You know, it, it's, uh, you know, you just, you, know, you move on. It, the, the season just could have been so differently. And Clark Winlet, you know, who won AOI this year, you know, he's somebody who I've looked up to my entire life and I've watched all of the shows and, you know, I can still get butterflies when I'm sitting here talking to him, but I've gotten to know him over the last few years and he's just a phenomenal guy, phenomenal angler and uh, very, very well deserving of what he did this year. Um, coming over from FLW like he did, um, just a super great man, um, but man, well deserved. And, you know, this is the year of the Garmin, guys. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm a polar ants guy this year, but I'm no shame. I'm not, I'm going to run what I got to next year. I mean, that's what 80% of us are going to have to do next year. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it seems like a trend a lot of guys are doing. It's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a fact. I wouldn't call it a trend anymore. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, there, there's going to be there's going to be very few guys that are not going to have a live scope in the front of their boat next year, and that's hats off to Garmin because this industry, especially the electronics, I mean, it's a rat race to see who can build the better mousetrap and who can build yeah. it faster. Garmin got there. I have no, no affiliation with Garmin whatsoever, but they got there and they perfected it, and they got there very quickly. Um, you know, hats off to them. And, you know, and I, there's a lot of people talking about, you know, I've even watched, you know, Dave Mercer and Luke Duncan's podcast the other day. They're the thing they're doing. They talked about, should it be banned? And I'm like, no, it shouldn't. I mean, that's, that is, you know, the electronics industry and our industry's job is to make us better as anglers. Now, and now do they have, you know, is it wrong? Yes. If you ain't running one, yeah. <laughs> if you ain't running one, I mean, I, I mean, that speaks volumes. I see fish, I'm like, what's that? I said it speaks volumes because now every company is duplicating it. Now that Garmin's well, they're trying to. You know, yeah. they're all and they all say Lawrence said it too. Hummingbird saying it. Oh, well, wait till you see what we got coming out first the next year. You're not going to need to run anything else. And we 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 hear that all every year. You know. Yeah. It's, you know, and I, I don't, I don't need a, you know, I, next year I'm not running, you know, my electronics, I'm not running contract with anyone. You know, I'm just, I'm going to run what's going to make me better as an angler. Right. And that's what a lot of us are doing. I mean, there are paid guys with some of these companies that are leaving just because, you know, and there's some guys this year and I'm not mentioning any names, but some guys that started running garments this year and they got fired halfway through the year because they were running a competitor's unit. But they were like, I needed to make myself better. And maybe I should have done the same thing. And I, but I said, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm just I'm going I'm to finish the year out, you know, next year, do it right. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, kudos to Garmin. I mean, they, they've, I mean, you can look at them and catch them now. Now you still got to be able to catch them. I mean, yeah. that, that's just because you know there's one there. I mean, doesn't mean you're still going to catch them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it's kind of neat how you can watch it and kind of decipher oh, yeah. the behavior of the fish. And it really I mean, just, yeah, and it's if like anybody watched the next decision, yeah, Patrick yeah. Walters put that on the map. The way he used that, yeah, it. I was just about to say, if any of you go back and watch Patrick Walters, at least, yeah. I mean, that dude straight up made us look at look like a group full of redheaded stepchildren. <laughs> the dude, the dude, I mean, the dude broke the century mark in the fall, yeah. the worst time of the year to fish. And he just absolutely <laughs> obliterated us. There was nothing we could do. You know, my, my <laughs> poor Ed Lockerin was in second place pretty much the whole darn tournament. And he's going in the final day and he's like, I'm 40 pounds behind. What do I do? Five or 30 pounds behind Patrick going into day four. Yeah. And he was like, What do I do? I was like, Dude, just go fish it. I mean, just. And it, so it, fun. Yeah, I mean, what do you do? I mean, yeah. I mean, if that was not an eye opener, but it wasn't just that one, guys. It was, it was St. Clair was the same situation. Mm -hmm. um, Lake Champlain, exact same situation. Everybody in the top ten was looking at him. They were all looking. Now Champlain, Brandon Polinick won that one without a Garmin, but Polinick is so dialed in on that three sixty. 
he can actually oh, yeah. see the fish on that 360, which is oh, extremely yeah. hard to do. Yeah. It's very, very hard to do, but he can do it. Um, and that's what he was doing. Right. Um, as he was using that 360, and he could see the yeah. fish. He could see the fish on the boulders. Yeah. It was a little different. You know, a lot of the guys that run the Garmin that were running the 360, they would find the boulders with the 360. They'd turn the Garmin over there, and they'd see the fish sitting on top of it. And you throw a drop shot over the top of them, and they would no, fight they over the bottom. Oh, they, they would fight. They wouldn't let it hit the bottom. They were so angry. And right, they, right. they just get it within view of them. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like playing a video game. How do you compete with that? You know, you can't. You know, right. it's like my man raised no fool right here, brother. I'm from South Louisiana. Mama did not raise a fool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, not, not last night. <laughs> you know? But, you know, and, 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 Pat, and, and Patrick Walters is a good dude. And I've gotten to know him the last couple of years. And, and last year he was running the Garmin, still getting to, getting to know it. And there was a couple of tournaments he didn't do well in last year, which was an anomaly. Um, and he was like, bro, he was like, I'm getting way too dependent on that Garmin. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that Garmin all the dang time. And he's like, next thing I know, half the day's gone and I've got like one fish. And then I just have to go fishing to catch, you know, what I caught. So, you got, I do think that there is a fine line there. I do, I do think this season would have played out differently if the schedule would have been when it was supposed to, I don't know if Garmin would have played as much as it did ended up doing with the revamp schedule. Right. But again, mommy ain't raising a fool, brother. I mean, yeah. time and place. I mean, time, it's, it, there's a time and place for it. And that's where this comes into, into effect. And all these guys out here that compete every year, they're, they're extremely, they're extremely smart individuals. Um, and that's why they're here. You know, there, there's no, there are no dummies in this industry, in, in, in this field. Um, um, you know, you can't just come out here and expect to get lucky every now and again right. um, and do well, you know, at, at this level because any one of those 85 guys can can win any of these tournaments at any time. And now you can give them the ability to see where the fish are at. You know. Good luck, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. well, there, there's two different takes that I have on that. And it, it's – the first one is if these companies are, are going to be – are going to continue to pay these series. The series are going to, there's no way they're going to stop them from saying, Hey, you can't use this. If they're showing up the money, they're going to be like, use whatever you want. As long as, you know, as they're still pumping the money. But also if, if the people who diss the, the live scope have mm -hmm. never watched 15 smallmouth, follow your a rig back to the boat. You're, you're laughing like a little kid watching them all swirl around your, your bait. Yeah, I, mean, well, I mean, the guys that diss the live scope are the guys that don't run it. And I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't run it. I ain't dissing it because I know what it'll do. Um, right. but, you know, you know, hats off to them. I mean, yeah. they got there and then, then there's, you know, and all the other, you know, all the other brands are trying to play catch up right now and they're trying to mm -hmm. come up with some, something as good. Um, but then there's, you know, there, there, there's, there, there's trademark infringements and there's, and there's, um, what do you call it? Um, like patents and stuff. Yeah, patent infringement. So they have to be different. They can't be exactly the same. So they're just fighting over that right now. Um, you know, next year is going to be interesting to see how the electronics industry and those companies handle that because there are so many guys, most of them that are just like, look, I'm running this, this, and this along with yours. What are you going to do? You know? Some yeah. of them are telling their guys, well, if you don't run an us exclusive, then you don't get this. And they're like, okay, bye. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of getting to that. I think Hummingbird was kind of the first one to come out and said, even though you don't run all of them, we'll still give you this. They're kind of the first ones. Yes, baby. Yes. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it's going to be, it's interesting to see what's going to happen. You know, I, I don't know that, you know, I don't, you know, Bass has been known for, you know, outlawing certain baits and stuff like that because of the whole competitive advantage thing. I don't know that any of that's going to come with any of this. Because right. like you just said, you know, the, 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 the money in the industry and the sponsorships and stuff like that, and the mess right. going to do with it. Um, and now that every company has them, everybody has the same advantage, especially. As the I guess so. You know, but you could say the same about an A-Rig. Why outlaw an A-Rig if everybody can use it? But I do understand the A-Rig part of it. 
I'm, I'm going to take that back because well, a lot every of people, state has different laws, and if you well, LA, well, the LA, A-Rig, Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, well, the A rig was more of. I think the reason why they outlawed that is because an A-Rig, when you catch a fish, there's hooks all in the fish and yeah. mm-hmm. the damage to the fish and stuff like that. I get that. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, you know, what do you do? You just got to run. You, you got to run what makes you better. Uh, right. And what I'm going to do, and along with most everybody else, um, so that you, you know, you got to Google. And it can help you win more money. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's gonna make us better, you know. If yeah. one of those companies wanted to pay me a bunch of money to run their product and not the Garmin, if it's enough, yeah, come on with it. Yeah. Why? Well, but you know, I, I just you know, it's got to you, know, you got a room. It's gonna make you better. And I'm, we're still waiting on our schedule for next year. Um, we have a pretty good idea, but they're supposed to release it sometime in the next couple of weeks um, to see how it plays off or when it plays out. So. You know, huge announcement! Huge announcement that came out a couple of days ago. Uh, Fox Sports and Bass oh, signed an enormous deal next year. Never, sweet. just never been done before. Um, you're going to see all nine Elite Series events plus the Classic have live coverage, uh, broadcasted live on their stations. Uh, no, baby. Um, so go watch a movie, baby. That'd be just a minute. Sorry, guys. I, I, I got to oh, no worries. Our co-host is always welcome. She just yeah. she loves the, she loves the camera. So <laughs> more people uh, the better. Yeah, she's right. Laughing. She's laughing at me now. Um, what's, her, what's her biggest fish? Um, just some brim, brim? Yeah, some perch. Um, but that'll change pretty quick. Heck yeah. Um, but yeah, but next fish. year, yeah, but the next year we'll have all nine events plus the classic live coverage on Fox Sports. Um, uh, which is going to be huge. That's never been done before. And, you know, this year the, the industry has grown so much as a whole, um, not just from suppliers and retailers and bait makers and rod suppliers and everybody else, but just the industry, you know, more people are fishing now. You know, you look at the, you know, every state's fishing license sales are up by hundreds of percents this year. Oh, yeah. That's telling you that this industry is growing big time. And, and you know, and, and we're kind of seeing the, the fruits of our labors right now and, and, and a company like Bassmaster who has the largest, you know, outdoor platform in the world by far. And they're just constantly grow, growing and evolving and finding better ways and more avenues for us to get out there to the people that I love you too, baby. <laughs> so they're just constantly finding more ways for us to, to get us out there as anglers and the brand to help educate everybody that's out there watching. So it's a great time to be in the industry. Great time to be with Bassmaster and uh, man, you know, can't wait, can't wait to get another season start, uh, another season started. Right. We have a comment in here asking if you can talk a little bit about your Cayuga eight. Um, I think he's meaning like cast yeah. a catch the whole season. Yeah, man. I, I, you know, I caught that fish on a chatter bait. Like I said, that was a, you know, Cayuga was a was a tough practice. You know, a lot of the that tournament was won, and a lot of the guys that were in the top five or six were all around the same area. I mean, there were everybody was looking at each other on the north end of Cayuga. Um, there's just really like a quarter of a mile stretch where just everybody was just packed in. And I'm not like that. I, I am I am not a crowd fisherman. If I see a crowd of people, I'm going to go the opposite way, and I'll take my mm-hmm. little just I can't fish like that. And, you know, does it hurt me sometime? Maybe it does, but I'm just not a crowd fisherman. So I spent majority of my practice on the lower end of that lake, which the lower end, there's not as big as a population it is on the north end of that place. But there are it is it is notorious and known for bigger fish down there. So that's what I targeted and in practice. I just I think in three days of practice for that event, I don't think I caught a fish before 10 o'clock in the morning. Got a bite. Before ten, I got one bite on chatterbait on a point way down there, and the sun would get up high, and I was actually catching some big smallmouth. Um, I had some, I had smallmouth pegged in the middle of the day up there on drop shot, uh, just on on isolated mooring buoys and boats. Um, um, but those big smallmouth, when the sun come up, they get up underneath them. And uh, you know, so the first day of that tournament, I actually ran the one spot I got a bite on. I said, I'm just going to run over there and start there and I picked up a chatterbait and I caught like a, you know, 
wasn't very long. I caught like a four on it. Then I caught like a three and a half small mouth on it. And this is first thing in the morning. So man, holy crap. And then I caught, I caught, then I caught that giant on a chatterbait. It was just some submerged, uh, um, mill full. Um, you know, of course that fish come up and a cool story. You know, the guy that was my marshal that day was, has been a fan and a follower of mine for like two or three years now. So he was all pumped up and he got to witness that he lived there. So, you know, lift the fish, put him in the boat. And he's like, Oh man, that's like a six pounder. I've never seen one that big. I was like, dude, I think it's a little bigger than that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he, was like, he was like seven, eight, seven, nine on my scale. And I, my scale weighs a little bit light. So I figured, man, that fish might be eight. Um, and then it was, you know, within the next 10 minutes, I lost like a three and a half and another two good ones. Both of them small mouth on that chatterbait of shallow. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was like five bites in 20 minutes. It was just that quick. And, but I was shaking from that eight. Yeah. But I was cool, calm and collected. I'm like, I, I was, I was totally surprised by that flurry and I only needed two more fish to fill my bag. And I said, Oh my goodness. I said, I'm going to have a chance to bust a big bag. Cause I really thought I was going to catch your small mouth at first day, but the forecast was totally different than what the weatherman said it was, of course. And uh, I needed high bright skies, low wind, and uh, it blew like the Dickens, and it, the sun never popped out. The smallmouth never ate. Um, I weighed in three fish that day for 16 and a half pounds the first day. Yeah. How was that run way back north in that blowing wind on that lake? Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that sucked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Andy Crawford actually come and covered me, one of the photographers up there, and there was some, there was some serious rollers coming down that lake that day. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that was a special fish, you know, that's, you know, especially up North like that. you know, I think there's been a couple of historians and said, I think that was the biggest fish weighed in in a Bassmaster event in New York to date, probably, um, was there. So that's pretty cool to hold that, but you know, Hey, you know, I mean, a blind squirrel finds a nut every now and again, you know, you swim it by one, he's up three and he's going to eat it, you know, but that, but a fish like that big, that's a Northern string bass. So I mean. You know, like I, yeah, awesome. it, it, that fish got to be 20 plus years old. I mean, to get that big, and it, was, it was healthy too, but it, yeah. you could tell that fish was old. Um, so, you know, kept really good care of it, got it all the way back, and um, and then that fish got released um, uh, and stayed alive. That's another thing the bass does incredibly well is, is you know, that their control um, – um, their control of those fish and trying to keep those fish alive, you know, from the time we get them out of our boats and they put them in the tanks, you know, Gene Gillian is our conservation director and that is all he's doing is measuring oxygen levels and temperature levels from, you know, from the holding tanks all the way to, uh, all the way to the catch and release boat. Man, they, they, they do and they, they, they do an absolute incredible job with that. So, uh, yeah, but yeah, that was a cool fish catch, man. You know, one big fish of the tournament and you, you never, um, um, you know, you never can complain when, when, when you win the Phoenix boats, big bass of an event. So, uh, that was, yeah. Cool. yeah. Jacob Bell's asking your chatterbait setup. I'm assuming he means rod and such. Yeah, man. I, you know, from rod to set up, you know, I use a, you know, that was a jackhammer, you know, I, I'm not affiliated with any chatterbait company. I was a jackhammer and I put a, solid green pumpkin three eighths, uh, Zayco trailer, the Yamamoto Zayco trailer. Um, that's 15 pound cigar, uh, fluorocarbon. <laughs> I'm you back there. Right. Oh, your shoulder back there. Yeah, well, I'm a little different. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a little different with my chatterbait setup. You know, I, I'm a St. Croix guy by heart. And, and of course, um, um, I'm, I'm part of their family. So, you know, I actually throw a Mojo Bass, which is their like $140 rod. It's Mojo Bass 7 1. It's a, it's a moderate, it's a moderate action with a, uh, with a, with a fast tip on it, hmm. um, which is a little different than a lot of people, you know, are used to throwing. They like a real limber tip and stuff. And to me, the most important part, especially on a chatterbait is getting a hook into the fish. If you can't drive that hook into that fish, you know, he's going to come up and spit it on you. Um, but that Mojo bass line and I, and I'm a St. Croix guy. And like I said, I, and I'm, most people know me for, for the legend extreme, but that St. Croix came out with this year. That's a $640 rod. And that thing is absent, an absolute dream in my hand. Um, but like for a chatterbait, I'll throw that Mojo bass and, you know, it, it's, it's a, a fifth of the cost. And that Mojo bass by St. Croix is probably the most, 
the best ride on the market for the money. Um, but yeah, that's my chatterbait setup. You know, I like I like to feel good. I, I like I really like I, I like to be able to feel my chatterbait all the way through the water. Um, um, and I like to and that and that extra fast tip on that that fast tip on there. I like to I like a backbone on that rod because you really need to drive that hook and that that hook into the fifth mouth on the chatterbait because if not, he's gonna come up and spit it on you every single time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Seth Doman here asks your favorite lake to fish. Well, of course, Seth, it's Lake Fork. <laughs> Seth is Seth is one of the live cameramen for Bassmaster, by the way. Oh, great. Oh, he's that's a, awesome. He, he, was, he was one of my cameramen. He was my cameraman at Lake Fork last year. Day three, I was in the top ten. Um, sat there and just grueled it out with me. I had a, I had a window. Those fish were eating from like 11 to 1 o'clock, and it was just – boring i caught one fish right there at the first start of the morning and then it was like four hours without a bite and then i caught like back-to-back -back sixes and you know it was just if that, that little window it was on but yeah seth's a great guy man he, he's one of the live cameramen that you guys see or that you guys don't see behind the camera you know <laughs> guys watching us live um you know he, he's he was there at lake fort a couple weeks ago to run a live camera for his ass. um but yeah you know you know, favorite lake to fish, you know, without that being said, because Seth asked, I'm going to say Lake Fork, but that's really not. You know, I'd, I'd have to go with – I'd have to go with St. Lawrence River, you know, upstate New York. St. Lawrence River, um, you know, maybe St. Clair, Michigan. I just love smallmouth. This dude's having all kinds of problems. Yeah. yeah. Andrew, <laughs> get it together over there, please. We're trying to do a show here. <laughs> good grief. Um, yeah, good. You know, so – you know, it's, you know, I just love catching smallmouth, man. I, I, I grew up in South Louisiana about five years ago. I'd never caught a smallmouth in my life. And uh, I have, you know, and I've done, I've had some pretty damn good tournaments in the last couple of years in the elite series up north, just because I have so much fun catching them up there. Right. Um, you know, like three or four of my biggest bags that I've weighed in the last two years have been in upstate New York or St. Clair, Michigan. I know if I had to pick one, I'd say I'd say St. Lawrence River because I love drifting sh deep shoals with that drop shot for those big for those big giant smallmouth up there. Uh, because when if you've never caught a smallmouth, people say, "Oh yeah, I've caught a smallmouth in Kentucky Lake." Right? I caught them in Table Rock. Yeah, I ain't no comparison to oh, going more north. Red, totally different. You catch them in thirty-five foot of water and a two mile an hour current. Good luck. And, uh, and, uh, you catch a five or six pound smallmouth down down that deep and that much current, and then and that'll make a man out of you. I can tell you that because mm -hmm. they, will, they will come up and just straight make you look like a <laughs> no one. Because uh, man, you'd have so much fun up there. I think yeah. one of my favorite parts about it is when you stick like a six pounder and you get those big like massive yeah. head shakes yeah. out. And you're like, yeah. oh dang, is that a drum? Yeah. And all well, of a sudden you're like yeah. reeling as fast as you can because yeah. they're helping up the jump. Well, have you guys seen the video? Any of y'all saw the video that went viral last year when I fell in the water after that giant in St. Lawrence River? No. I don't think I, oh, y'all have not. Oh, goodness. Okay. I'm yeah. yeah. sure I've seen it. Do you know what? Uh, sort it's, of, it's on my social media channels. Um, uh, my Marshall video, the whole thing. I hooked up with to date. Biggest smallmouth I've ever seen. It was probably a seven. I don't know. I've caught I caught a six something in St. Clair this year. That was my personal best. But this fish in St. Lawrence River last year was I don't know how big. It was big. It was just called big. And I'm not a good judge at him. But he jumped three or four times, and you know I went around to grab him. And when I grabbed him, the hook come out, and I reached down with both hands while he was off, and I grabbed him. And he started just wiggling, and I tried to follow him, and I went head first after the fish. Oh no! I got the whole thing on camera. Um, yeah, I went head first into the, into the St. Lawrence River um, after that giant fish. But yeah, you guys will find, and y'all, I'm sure y'all will love it. Whenever you do I think see Bailey it, just he's found it. scouring the internet right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's on my social media pages, but yeah, you got to go back and look at the time we fished the St. Lawrence River last year. Oh, man. Um, right. More videos. Let's see. Um, I shared, and I, I think I probably shared it again since then. But but oh yeah, it went viral at the time. Um, I had a great marshal that time. He vid every time I would hook up with one, he would turn the camera on and start videoing. So he caught the whole thing on camera. And that same, we were there in August too, and that same long trip was cold, partner, of that time of the year too. Oh, I bet. Yeah, our water doesn't get that warm, like 72, 73. Yeah. 
it ain't warm because uh -uh, it comes from you know all the great lakes and on down and it, it, it was it was not warm like you would expect it to be in the middle of the summertime it was chilly uh yeah. but yeah yeah that was uh yeah that, that was that's, to date that was the biggest small mouth i've ever seen in my life um and i didn't even catch it so oh no you know i've caught some fives and stuff and i caught like a six seven this year in practice of course practice um Practice and, and St. Clair this year, um, just giant, giant fish. Uh, gosh, they're so fun to catch. Those St. Clair fish so, are a little different than like the St. Lawrence, Lake Ontario. There's, there's, there's nowhere like St. Clair. St. Clair, exactly. there's just, oh. it is mindless. St. Clair is mindless. It is a bowl of just the exact same thing from front to back, and yeah. you just drift. And you drew. Were you the one who won a BFL there as a co angler? Or a yeah, I actually live in <laughs> Michigan now. <laughs> so I yeah. St. Clair pretty. You know, you and have to be the spring. Yeah, yeah. And, all, and all of a sudden you catch one, you know, and it's like, okay, you catch a five pounder. Like, where the crap did you come from? You know, a few hours later, you get another bite, and then all of a sudden you fish a whole day and you've drifted all these lines and you go back and you notice the waypoints are lined up to where you yeah. got bit. Then it starts making kind of a little sense until tournament day when you don't get bit on any of those waypoints anymore. Um, but you know, I ended up making a top. I ended up making a cut there. But you know, I ended up going to the river. You know, I just I was actually two years in a row. I broke my personal best. I weighed in a twenty five pound bag of smallmouth in the AOY Championship last year at St Clair in the river. I was drifting that thing like we did the St Lawrence River. Yeah, uh, heavy drop shot in current shoals in that river. And uh, that's what I ended up doing this year. I went up there and I caught, I don't know, I had 19-something the first day and then another 17 and then another 17-something. Um, but I just, the lake, I just couldn't get any consistency there. I just, you know, I had to go up there and drift shoals. Um, um, yeah, St. Clair's got them. I and I always go up there and catch four or five giant musky, too. Oh, so, oh yeah. God, I hate them yeah. Things. Anywhere on the Great Lakes. I hate them things. You know, musky you fishermen get mad when you say you hate musky. They say, oh. I love to catch a giant. Yeah. I, I make so many casts for try to catch one. Like yeah. 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 10,000 casts, right? It's like, my goodness. Yeah. And we can get away from them. Yeah. Put a great bait or a chatterbait in your hand in, 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 in St. Clair and try to go a day without catching a muskie. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, I've gotten one of my cameramen. I had a camera one of the days up there at, at St. Clair and I caught a, an absolute dinosaur tiger muskie up there. <laughs> Eight pound fluorocarbon on mm. a, on, a, on that little spin giant, the little spy bait, and he had it right on top of his head too. And I got my bait back, and I couldn't believe it. He was, oh, man. and my cameraman was freaking out. He was one of the guys that films for for uh, uh, for Zona and KVD and stuff. And he was like, he's a big musky fisherman. He was like, man, that's a big. He said, man, you, you don't know how many people would mount that thing. And I was like, I just want my damn spy bait back and let him go. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> ride it off the top of his head and let him go. Right. Um, but yeah, but yeah, they, they, I, just, I have so much fun up north, man. Anywhere up north, I'm in. Any time of the year, I don't care. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to share screen. I've never share screen with one screen before. I usually have a couple monitors, but we're gonna try it here and play the video of you falling in. Oh, did you think you found it? Huh? We found it. Oh yeah, we found oh. it. I'm gonna try to share screen this so we can play it for everybody. Yeah, yeah. We'll share it. Let's see if oh, there we go. This is comedy hour. Facebook. You see it? Can you guys see that? Oh, yeah. I can see it. Yep. Right. I just pulled it up on my phone to see if we can. I mean, I hooked this fish in 30 foot of water, guys. And that's camera don't do it justice, but that is easily and that fish is well over six. That's a big one. Do y'all see where my mistake was? Do y'all see it? Yep. Grab the line. It's so Grab the line. Timber. I grabbed the line. And that was one of the And I never even knew I did it. And I, I wasn't yeah. after I watched the video. I'm like, why did I why did I do that? I just, yep. You know, and I uh, you know. It's so hard not to do. Well, it's my it's just it's just my inexperience, and I haven't done it enough. And I'm, I was, you know, and you know, I, I didn't realize I did it at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. But I thought, but that fish had come up and jumped like five or six times, and I would just crap on myself every time they did it. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. hey, look at the size of the smallmouth! Oh my god! And and that day I weighed in like nineteen something. That was day three, 
and I'd never been more disappointed to weigh in 19 and a half pounds of smallmouth in my life. I was so, I was just, I was, because I actually had two more big, big ones um, come off that day. It's funny because in that deep current, when you lean into one, he's going to do one or two things. He's either going to, he's either going to dig, you know, but those you can catch almost every one of them, or he's going to come straight up from the time you put the hook in him. And it just seemed like every fish I hooked that day, he would just come straight up. And when he comes straight up, you just reeling slack and you're trying to keep him tight and you're just praying. And if you could survive that first jump, you can catch him. Yeah. Now the fish that would stay down and they would dig and they would head shake, I could catch just about every one of them. Right. Um, but I had two more like four to fives that day that just just straight up from the start and there's nothing you could do about it. And they just come off and I was just I was like demoralized after that third day because I had a chance to weigh in a giant, giant bag that third day. I and I and I burned like six gallons of gas in three days at St. Lawrence over that year. I was running nowhere. I had three shoals I was rotating. And there were big, big ones on them. And I kind of figured the place out. And these shoals that run, you know, with the current in the St. Lawrence River, but there was real subtle veins that ran perpendicular to the current that had sporadic boulders on them that that current would hit. And those big smallmouth would sit right behind the boulders. And if I, I could make a drift perfectly and I could come over one of those boulders, I would catch a giant every single time if I could drift it right. Um, yeah, that's the hardest part is you know where they live. It's just lining that boat up. And right it's so back. hard to do that. And, and that much current, I mean, you're, you're half ounce drop shot. And if you're off, you know, a foot or two, you're just not going to hit them, you know. And But if I could hit that boulder and I'd come over the top of it and it fall behind the back of it, I mean, I could just go ahead and just load up because he was going to be there every single time. And that's where all of my big fish come from that time. Um, but, yeah, St. Lawrence River is awesome, man. I, I, can't wait to, I can't wait to get back up there next year. Mm -hmm. I've been wanting to fish there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Andy, Zach, you guys got any questions left for Derek here? Yeah. Any of the folks got so. any questions for Derek before we uh, ask him our last question here? Derek, I'll throw the last question at you. And if, if any of the folks what have some. What bourbon you're sipping on? The what now? Favorite sipping bourbon since bourbon and bass. Oh, yeah. You guys don't follow bourbon and bass. There's two things. I do, I just, I, Favorite I, sipping bourbon. Um, you know, I, don't, I like Blanton's to sip neat. Um, you know, what I'm sipping on right now is actually E.H. Taylor. It's Buffalo from Buffalo Trace. It's E.H. Taylor small batch. Hmm. Uh, incredibly hard to find. It's very, very smooth, um, very sippable. You know, it's you know, there's some that you know that aren't so good, and you can mix them with whatever you want to. But there's some that just are really, really smooth and have a great flavor to them, and a really good profile. E. H. Taylor, Blanton's, both come from the Buffalo Trace Distillery in Kentucky, um, which I'm a big Buffalo Trace Distillery guy, and it's, they're just really hard to find. Okay, um, but you know, on your way home, can you get me a bottle from there? Uh, yeah, good luck with that. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, they're very hard to find. <laughs> especially like an E.H. Taylor, you know, I have actually had two bottles and I had one that a, buddy, a good buddy, a good friend of mine, Bo, got, got it for me for my birthday this year. And I said, I'm not going to open until I find another one. And I was actually, Lake Chickamauga, I stopped at this hole in the wall liquor store there because I like stopping at them and just see what they got. And the dude had a bottle of E.H. Taylor on the shelf and I'm like, do you know what you have? Never mind. I just grabbed it and I checked out and left. <laughs> so, it was probably like got, super cheap compared to what it should have been. Well, it, it was about retail, which was fine. And you'll find some places every now and again that'll have the rare ones, and they're like three times retail. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, no, no thank you. So I, I didn't open the first bottle until I got the second one, just because mm -hmm. like, I'm more of a collector than I am a drinker. I like to sip on them occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but bourbon and bass is, I haven't done a bourbon and bass on each Taylor yet. And that's actually one I'm going to film tomorrow that I'll come out with this week. Mm -hmm. Heck yeah, let us know and we'll share it around. I do appreciate it, guys. Yeah, of course. But uh, our last question for you before we wrap things up here is uh, if you could invite any three people to sit down, have a steak, and a – I usually say a beer, but for you we'll say a glass of bourbon. So if you could pick any three people, it doesn't have to be Classy. fishing. They could be present. They could have been alive 400 years ago. What three people would you invite to sit down, have a steak, glass of bourbon, pick their brain? 
Oh, well. For what? All, uh, yeah. You're not you, Peyton. You're not old enough. <laughs> um, you know, um, you know, John Cruz, um, um, he's become a good buddy of mine the last couple of years. Missile, you guys know him, Missile Bates. Um, him and I are both big bourbon guys. Uh, we travel together in the Elite Series. Um, he'd have to be at the table. He's always good for, he's always really good for good conversation. Um, another one will be a very good friend of mine, Lucas Ragusa. Um, you know, he's, he's a guy that had traveled with me for, to, with the Opens. The three years I was qualifying, just one of my best friends in the world. Um, gosh, this is so tough. And another one is another good buddy of mine, Bo Bro. He does not fish at all, but he's a huge bourbon guy, huge state guy. You know, but, man, I, I, that's kind of, you know, that, that that's interesting. Just try to see somebody from the past that I sit down and have a steak and a drink with. You yeah. know, about it later, too, and you're like, oh, man. I'll like sit down with that guy. And you think about it, it'll pop up in your head like a couple days later. You're like, oh, I want, I will totally sit down with you know, that. I'll, I'll throw one out. I'm gonna throw one out there that nobody's thinking of right now. But Steve Hefner. Oh, okay. Yeah. Third ball. <laughs> There's a third ball for you, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because actually, I started watching. Um, there's a documentary on. Um, Amazon Prime video right now on the Hugh Hefner story. I'm just so intrigued by guys that came to just came from nothing and they grew an absolute empire during a time where that was just unacceptable. Right. I don't care about the, you know, the sex part or anything like that, but just how somebody's mind like that works. You know, the guy that founded McDonald's, you know, <laughs> you know the guy, what was, what was the, the Netflix series? The guy that founded McDonald's that came out with about six or eight, came out six, a year or so ago. Yeah. I think um, it was called the founder, right? Founder. Yeah, founder. founder. Yeah, yeah. 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 But that's the kind of stuff that intrigues me. It's like guys that came from nothing and they just, it, they did the impossible. Um, that's what just drives me. It's like I came from nothing. It was an impossible feat to get where you got. And it's like, okay, how did he get there? You know, I want to see what his, you know, what was in the back of his mind. So that's why I say Hugh Hefner, just simply because I started watching that series and, um, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff just intrigues me. Um, but yeah, that would be a pretty interesting guy to sit down and have a drink with and a steak and just 100%. You know, pick his brain a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sweet, Derek. Well, we, uh, yeah, I think we that's the first Hugh choice. choice. I have not heard Hugh. Oh, yeah. I think you're uh, the first person to say Hugh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the first one. yeah. <laughs> it was fresh on my mind. I started watching the documentary, so um, yeah, he's just super interesting. Yeah, a lot of people don't like him. That's okay. I'm just interested in the way that his business mind worked. You know, yeah, hundred yeah. yeah. percent. How about it? Heck yeah. Well, dude, thank you so much for taking time out of your night. We really appreciate it. It was a blast to talk to you. You're always welcome on the show. Yeah, anytime, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. If anybody, Good luck yeah. In 2021. Yeah, man. Anybody, Facebook, uh, DBH Fishing, um, Instagram, Derek Hudnall Fishing, or uh, my YouTube channel as well. You guys check me out. Everything's linked down below in the descriptions. Mm -hmm. You guys can go right in the description and click on all of them. I do appreciate it, guys. And uh, everybody, dream big. Talk to you guys soon. Heck yeah. Take care, Derek. Have a good night, Derek. See you, man. Good night. Goodbye. What a good dude. It makes me want to go buy a, a bottle of bourbon. I can completely relate to the whole on the way home. I was like, spending that much time of your life not catching smallmouth, and then you finally get to go catch smallmouth. It's just like, well, yeah, you I caught like what twelve over six pounds this spring. Yes, <laughs> but that was spring. You know what I mean? That I, that's how Lake Saint Clair is Unreal. in the spring. Unreal. You know, if you fish it hard enough in the spring, you can catch twelve Fair over enough. six pounds too. Fair enough. You know, that's it wasn't just a me thing. Like it was found a simple jerk. Bite. It was nuts. <laughs> Speaking this of jerk baits, I'm pretty upset thought. about this. You see this right here? This is a 110. Uh -huh. I've used it like two times and the eye fell out. Piss. <laughs> How much of that do you think? Okay, do you think that actually makes a difference though? No, probably not. But I mean, I think I, the eyes on bait are more than I for the people. A little pro tip here I'm going to take a sharpie and probably put two black dots right behind the gill plate. Mm -hmm. Give them something to focus on. That's probably what I'm going to end up doing with another that it's eyeless. What I, I do is my the eyes just helps them. If you're watching Bass eat a bait fish, it usually eats it what face first, right? right. So 
tail sticking out of its mouth, eyes down. So I think the eyes give it something to focus on. So that's why I think the eyes are actually kind of crucial. So if it's coming at it from that's a good point, yeah. I'll be at the right side. Yeah, he's going to eat it, but if he's coming from the left side, he's probably going to be like, what the hell is this blind dingbat thing doing running through this water in front of me? That don't look right. So put yeah. a little black dot on it, probably get chewed. Maybe. Yeah, what I do, I take highlighter, like a neon highlighter, and I, I color right under the treble hooks. And that's uh, – it kind of gives – especially when you're fishing smallmouth, it gives them something to pinpoint on. I, I That's not my ID either. I took that from Benjamin Nowak, so shout out to him. But it's kind of like a different thing, especially you do it on your front treble hooks. So they try to get more of that bait. Could get you a better hookup ratio. Yeah, I mean, not to blast Mega Bass here, but here's another one that's got uh, Miss Bill. I made one cast with this bait. Yeah, not going that color this week. <laughs> <laughs> I know why. I think I have like four matches more something else. Color. I love mm -hmm. this. Color. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's but, all we're going to say, just in case there's any fellow it doesn't even, editors it watching. Doesn't even have hook rash. It's just like that new, I mean, huh? one cast and the bill broke. Hmm. You know what they say about guys that break bills off their jerk baits? You slap it on the grass too much, or you slap the grass off too much. So, I remember <laughs> the exact day I bought this. I was a fishing <laughs> there's a song about that, you know. <laughs> Fishing from shore in the water was 36 degrees. There was no grass to be had. And I literally made a cast and I hit it once. And I was like, why is my bait fluttering through the surface? So I hit it again. It kept saying like subsurface. I literally reeled mm -hmm. it up and the bill was gone. <laughs> yeah. Same hate to see it. it broke off when it hit the water. I hate to see it. Factory default. Right. You know? And it's a clean break too. It's not even like I hit anything with it. It's literally a straight line. Yeah. <laughs> I had a pike. I had a pike slam one of my jackals on the side of the kayak one day and just obliterated it. It just blew into a thousand pieces. <laughs> but that was from a pike. Real quick, while we have people still here on the live uh, tomorrow night, guys, uh, Friday Mark night, Rose. same time, same time, seven thirty. We're gonna have Mark Rose on. Mark, and we're giving away Rose. a lot of stuff. Uh, we have a give a giveaway going on right now on the Sears Angler page. What up, Simon? Uh, <laughs> For <laughs> this casually walks through, <laughs> uh, giveaway right First now, Pierce Angler uh, apparel. So Wait a minute, am I allowed to win any of that? Yeah, you're allowed no. to win. You can enter it. I mean, if, he's already got some. I don't know. So if I win, win, people are gonna think this was rigged. Could be no, equal opportunity. Good. If I win, I will donate it to somebody. Are, yeah, head over to our Twitter or Facebook. Instagram. Yeah, enter on any page you'd like. Win, win some stuff. We're giving away a bunch of stuff tomorrow, including. Queen tackle packages, some jigs. Uh, Amp is going to be giving merch. stuff away. Morgan Marine, uh, anglers giving stuff away, and then Mark Rose himself is giving Douglas away a hat. Douglas hat, a signed jersey. So that's pretty sweet. How are you going to choose the winner? Mark well, Rose is going to choose the winner. So he will be like on one of the random deals well, online. Yeah, Mark Rose's favorite question tomorrow night in the comment section is going to be who wins. The Mark Rose signed jersey. Mark Rose is going to pick the winner. Hmm, I'll just make an alias name and have to throw some a lot of questions out there. One of them, one of them is bound to get picked. <laughs> constantly typing questions. Ronnie Shackelford. <laughs> Ronnie Shackelford. Type away. <laughs> Phil McCracken. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get too crazy with the names. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fun show tonight. 100% a lot of fun. Uh, Derek was great. Make sure you guys Thank go down and follow him on the social medias. Tune yeah, in to Bourbon and Bass. Louisiana. Yep. And uh, looking forward to tomorrow night. Andy, you got any last remarks? Zach, any last remarks? Uh, uh, get a stand for your phone, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you <laughs> fell on like 10 times? We weren't sure if you fell or the phone fell. <laughs> well, that's holding it up. This stand? So swimming a T3 swim bait. No, it's uh I thought I think a, I thought I seen a 13 on there. Oh, T3. I'm blind. Right, blind right as a bat. Mm -hmm. And then in front of them, I have a pair of like heavy duty needle does. We're nice. gonna have to we're gonna have to get you a, a computer, a microphone, and a camera and write it off as a business expense. Well, so I had I do have a computer I normally use, but the wife had to work till eight, so I was stuck mm. in the disaster of my fishing area. 
with the iPad. Try we're to gonna get to your computer. own computer. That's what we're gonna do. We're going big. We're going big time on this. Go big or go home. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. and tomorrow I forgot to announce that tomorrow we're gonna be announcing our big announcement for episode 150. So tune in tomorrow. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a big party. Mark Rose coming through. Zach will be here as well. Simon, if he, if he oh, wants to show rats. up. Rats. And, uh, it's <laughs> going to be a lot of fun. But, boys, you got anything left before we sign off here? Nah, man. Tune yeah, in to the back. Everyone back stay at. Keep up with me and Bailey this weekend. Absolutely. Yeah. Heck, yeah. What were you saying, Andy? Just represent Bass Nation all the way around. Everyone Sorry. Everyone <laughs> stay healthy. COVID is running rampant at the moment. So, stay healthy and safe. Damn Halloween parties. Halloween parties and political celebrations. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's all right. Winter's coming. Everybody be indoors and mind their maybe, own. Maybe that'll drive more. Indoors. That'll help. Who knows? <laughs> nah, that's all right. After, after this weekend at Chickamauga, I probably won't see people until spring anyways. It's true. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be my last tournament of the year. I'll be so. in my office and in the woods. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll be, I'll be hunting thing. some more. Yep, Zach and I will be hunting. I've been hunting what? once so huh? far this year. Only once. What, what is hunting? 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 You ain't never been hunting? There, there's hunting. And That's there's what we're doing in Louisiana. You guys go hunting, hunting up in New York. <laughs> there's hunting and then hunting. There's, there's hunting. <laughs> hunting <laughs> is going out in the woods. Hunting <laughs> is putting something on the ground. Yeah, hunting. It, yeah, we're going to eat <laughs> tonight. We're going to eat tonight. We Even if I got to shoot an arm, we're gonna eat. <laughs> I've never ate arm. Picking up roadkill on the way home. <laughs> we might eat one way or another. I would. I would give you a pass. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. I think I'm gonna do it for tonight. We got stuff to do here. But uh, Andy, another great show, my friend. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, I'll and, talk uh, to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. And um, yeah. yeah, good luck in practice tomorrow. And Appreciate it. Hopefully, both of you find some stuff and one to finish. For I'll we'll probably find it. Actually, you know, I might actually find something because he keeps finding just stuff. Gonna have Bailey catch Maybe away. tomorrow's my day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Thank you again for tuning in. As always, thank you guys for watching and listening. See you guys next time.